Um, welcome to Cheer and Schmooze. Um, I'm Nadia, for those who don't know me, and uh, actually Andy and David hardly know me, and thank you so much for uh, agreeing to host this. And I don't live here, somebody else if I lived here, but I might move in if that's okay. <laughs> So thank you so, so much. And thank you, Gila, for um, agreeing to uh, talk and for spreading the word. And apparently more people are lost, but we're going to start anyway, because we don't have enough chairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. What's your next Nadler? So um, uh, ever since uh, Gila and I became mates at Linwood, I've been trying to get him to come to uh, teach at Sheeran Shmooz, and eventually we found a date. Which was postponed about five times since. So anyway, and uh, you guys have all read about her or know her, so I'm just going to hand it over. Thank you very much. Um, oh, and wait, Tadaka. Oh. Ten shekels to Tadaka, and Tadaka is Shochentov, did we say? Shochentov. And please turn off your mobiles, and we'll collect the money at the end, okay? Yeah. Oh, and if anybody, somebody said, oh, I'm really sorry, I, I've got a lot to work, so I'm going to have to miss the ball. Um, uh, that didn't sound right. <laughs> so it's probably one between two. Yeah. Uh, well, I made thirty-five. Nothing very presumptuous to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I assume there is no more sharing. Two, two, one, two, Um, they are going round. Okay, one between two people. Remain at the back. One between two. And I'd like to start with something of a personal confession. Um, I started teaching Agadah, or Talmudic narrative, a few years ago um, in response to the very lovely Yoni Shiller. We made it all happen. Um, and about a year after, I started teaching a weekly women's shia. And about a year later, moved to co-ed settings. And when I did, there were two things I completely stopped doing. I stopped teaching women's texts because I didn't want to be the token woman doing the token woman thing. And I stopped teaching anything which had any kind of sexual dimension to it uh, because that was just way out of my comfort zone. And having done this for a few years, I've um, discovered that much to my own frustration, I've been avoiding some of the very best stories in the Talmud. Um, and as I've heard such wonderful things about Shir and Shmooz, I want to take tonight as an opportunity to push myself out of that comfort zone and look at a story that's both very much about a woman and 
very much about sex. And I say this because it's very easy when discussing this kind of subject matter to sort of lower the tone, you know, descend into below the belt humor. And I'd like to ask that we try and avoid this. Um, because this is a profoundly subtle story, a story dealing with some incredibly sensitive issues, some very delicate human emotion. And I think a story that has a great deal to teach us about man-women relations, but also about relation human relationships in general. And it's this that I'd like to ultimately get at. Um, now, before actually reading the story, I'd like to take a few minutes and discuss the context. Um, one very basic rule of thumb when studying Agadah, and those of you who have ever been to any of my classes know that I like to say this a lot, you must always study Agadah in context. Both the textual context, the place in the Talmud in which it appears, the general suvia, and the socio-cultural context, the world from which the story originated. Sadly today, I mean, Happily, Agadot have become very popular and everybody likes to read them and try and understand them. Sadly, uh, very often, people decontextualize them. They impose upon them their own contemporary sensibilities and as a result, they come away with a very skewed, very inaccurate interpretation. Um, and the stories of the Talmud really can only be understood on their own terms, in the language of the world in which they were born. So before we look at the story, a few words about the world in which it was born. And the world is this. Since the beginning of time, or at least since the beginning of humankind, women have always been divided, dichotomized, forced into two basic feminine stereotypes. The good woman and the bad woman. The saintly and the seductive. The maternal and the immoral. The pure and the promiscuous the faithless, the honest housewife, and the faithless femme fatale. This phenomenon, which is later referred to by scholars as the Madonna Hall paradigm, really cuts across the board. And if you think about it, think of Akkadian mythology, the epic of Gilgamesh. On the one hand, we have the very nurturing, very loving Minsun, who is the mother of Gilgamesh. On the other hand, we have the dangerous, um, temptress, Ishtar, who tries to destroy him. Think of Jewish folklore. On the one hand, we have Eve, the mother, the first mother. On the other hand, we have Lilith, Adam's first disobedient demon wife. Christianity, we have the Virgin Mary, the paradigmatic Madonna, and Mary Magdalene, the prostitute even though today it's disputed, it wasn't disputed, but that was generally the belief for a very long time. Um, Greek literature, Homer. On the one hand, we have Penelope, the obedient wife who waits faithfully for years and years for Odysseus to come home. On the other hand, we have Circe, the witch who seduces Odysseus and entraps him on her island for a whole year. And turns men into pigs. Sorry? And turns men into pigs. And turns men into pigs. Um, <laughs> So whatever the mythology, whatever the culture, whatever the folklore, a woman can only be a Madonna or a whore. There is no middle ground. Um, now, we might like to think that this is some sort of primitive worldview that belongs to some sort of bygone era and that today we are far more enlightened than that. Unfortunately, this isn't really the case. Um, <clears throat> over the 2,000 years of this paradigm, it's become refined and sophisticated, but it's never really gone away. And think about popular culture today. You probably could give more examples than I can, because popular culture isn't really my thing, but think of the Bond movies, the Bond girls. On the one hand, you have the helpful, loyal, loyal sidekicks, Christmas Jones. And on the other hand, you have the treacherous murderesses. Electra King. Those of you who've seen the film Black Swan, mm. White Swan and Black Swan, Natalie Portman and Mila Kunis. 
Uh, or think about possibly the most famous Madonna Hall pair of the 20th century. Jackie Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. Um, turn the source sheet to page, uh, to, turn the page on the source sheet to number four. It's a poster. You're a Marilyn or a Jackie. Um, the poster is actually a reproduction of a Mad Men episode. And because I now have an iPhone and this works at home, I hope it works now. You can do this. You can try and do this. I'm sorry for those of you who won't see, but try and do this. I was thinking, women right now already have a fantasy, and it's not going up the Nile. It's right here in America. Jackie Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe. Every single woman is one of them. Watch this. Um, the scene sort of goes on where, you know, the men are all getting a kick out of this Jackie Marilyn thing until one woman says, well, what if not all women are a Jackie or a Marilyn? Maybe that's just the way men see them. Um, now, going back to the ancient world, and I'm going to bracket the question of what actually happens today, but in the ancient world, this paradigm was so pervasive, it actually left the realm of folklore and became an actual split or division in the household. It was not at all uncommon for a man to have two women in his home. A Madonna, a wife, for childbearing, and a whore, a concubine for sexual gratification. Demosthenes, the very famous Greek orator from the 4th century BCE, says in number Three in the source sheet. Mistresses we keep for pleasure, and wives to bear us legitimate children and be our husbands. That's for our Western culture. What about Jewish culture? And here it becomes a little more complicated. On the one hand, the practice, the actual practice of keeping two women for the fulfillment of one's procreative and sexual needs is though not entirely forbidden, very strongly condemned as immoral, as terribly unjust. In fact, when the rabbis want to pinpoint the sin of the generation of Noah, of the flood, they pick this as the sin. Look at number five. And can I ask someone to read because I really don't want to read it. Who's reading? Who's the Thank you. The men of the generation of the flood used to act thus. Each took two wives, one for procreation and the other for sexual gratification. The former would stay like a widow throughout her life, while the latter was given to drink a potion of roots, so that she should not bear, and then she sat before him, made up as a harlot. And that, say the rabbis, that was the sin that destroyed the world. Having these two women for these two different roles. Another story that we have in Tubot 62b about Rabbi Yudan and Asi. Could you go on to it? After the marriage, Rabbi's son departed and spent 12 years at the academy. By the time he returned, his wife had lost the power of procreation. What shall we do, said Rabbi? Should we order him to divorce her? It would be said, the poor soul waited in vain. Were he to marry another woman, it would be said, the latter is his wife and the other his mistress. He prayed for mercy to be vouchsafed to her, and she recovered. Thank you. So, Rebbe absolutely does not want to allow his son to marry another wife because that would be unfair to the original wife, who would then be reduced to the role of a whore. There's another very interesting interpretation. If you think about the story of Yaakov, when did Yaakov go back to Canaan from Haran? Anyone remember? After Yosef was born. After Yosef was born. Why? Because? That was the last of the wives he needed. Exactly. 
According to one very interesting interpretation, Yaakov was really nervous about going back to Knan, to Yitzchak, his father, with one very beautiful wife who had no children, and one very plain wife who had many children. The implication being that he too committed the sin of the Madonna whore paradigm of marrying a Madonna and a whore. So, we see that the rabbis very much disapprove of the Madonna whore paradigm in practice. In theory, however, the Madonna whore paradigm still seems to very much dominate Jewish law, both in its stories and its narrative parts. Think of the Bible. We have a whole slew of Eve and Lilith archetypes. On the one hand, we have the mothers, for instance, Sarah and on the other hand, we have the femmes fatale of the Bible, Potiphar's wife, Delilah, Jezebel. And in the non-story or the non-narrative parts, which seem to establish a very clear distinction between the modesty and demureness of a good woman and the brazenness and abandon of her fallen sister. Look at number six. Sheila, when you get sick of reading, I'm just going to read that. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel. So that's a verse in Dvarim, Lot Yek the Shabbat Lot Yisrael, I believe it is, on which Ramban comments, she, she who guards herself from abomination and lechery is called holy, a Kedusha, and she who removes herself from holiness and is defiled with lechery is called a whore, Kedusha. So in Hebrew there's an actual play on words. The Madonna who's Kedusha and the whore who's Kedusha. We also have very many, I picked a few, but I could have gone on and on, descriptions of how a good woman ought to act and how a bad woman acts. Look at the following um, two, uh, two quotes from the, uh, from the Midrash and from the Talmud. It is the matter of the daughters of Israel that they are neither loud-voiced, nor high-paced, nor wanton with merrymaking. So the good women are quiet and modest and demure, as opposed to the bad women. A woman prefers one cub and sexual indulgence to nine cub and continue. Contentious. Bad woman lectures. Um, yes. Sorry, what's a cub? Sorry? Oh, a cub is a measurement. In other words, a woman would rather have a lot, lot less if it meant sexual indulgence than have a lot more if it meant continence. <clears throat> so, even though Judaism officially the party line. Questions? Um, yes. Um, this, this paradigm that you mentioned, though, every one of the examples you gave was, was a non Jewish woman. And you know, there's a midrash about Potiphar's wife having converted and later become. Right, 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 right. There, there are interesting plays on this distinction. And if I were absolutely honest, I would say that one thing that really muddles my theory, or the theory I'm trying to present, is we have a stock character throughout the Bible of a good woman, a loyal woman, who actually brings about the redemption through sexual transgression. Right? We're all thinking of Wut, if you all just read the last week. Oh. And Tamar, and Estelle, and Yael, and later on Yudit, so, and the daughters of Lot. Um, so, yes, there are exceptions to this rule. But these exceptions are so difficult to understand, they're so problematic <coughs> that I'd like to bracket them and put them aside. Okay. Um, so, although officially the party line is that Judaism rejects the Madonna Hall paradigm, it's still very much steeped within its culture. Uh, one person who researches is Nitzha Valvanel, and look at what she says in number two. <clears throat> Since the beginning, we find two opposite feminine stereotypes. The positive, loyal, moral woman who is beloved, wise, and charged with the, pres uh, the preservation of the family unit and cultural continuity. And by contrast, the sensual, attractive woman who is independent, illustrious, uh, enticing, self-indulgent, and loyal, primary to herself. Thank you. So this is the background I want us to have in mind when we read the story. That said, let us now look at the story. Um, it appears in a sugya dealing with the laws of Hebrew. Sorry. Because, uh, 
of Yichud, seclusion with members of the opposite sex. Um, we first have some sort of legal discussion, and then we have a whole series of stories, I've not very often come in series, dealing with all manner of sexual deviation. We have stories of adultery, we have stories of seduction. And at the end of this list of very unpleasant stories, very disturbing stories, we have our story. Now what I'd like to do is read it. It's short, it's deceptively short, because it's very complex. Read it straight through once, understand that we don't understand it, and then sort of go back, try and delve in, and make sense of it. Um, does anybody else want to read? We'll get to elaborate. Thank you. Number one. It was Rabbi Ben Ashi's custom, whenever he prostrated himself, to say, prostrated himself to say, "May the merciful one save me from the evil inclination." One day, his wife heard him. She said, "For many years he has separated himself from me. Why does he say this?" One day, he was studying in his garden. His wife made herself up and passed before him repeatedly. He said to her, "Who are you?" She said. I am Karuta, and I just returned today. He demanded her services. She said to him, bring me that pomegranate at the end of that branch. He jumped up, went, and brought it to her. When he came home, his wife was firing the oven. He rose up and sat in it. She said to him, what is this? He said, thus and so happened. She said, it was me. He paid no attention to her until she gave him the signs. He said to her, nevertheless, my intention was to violate the prohibition. That righteous man fasted until he died that day. Everyone understand? Okay. Um, number one. Okay, so before we even try and begin to delve in, I should tell you that this is probably one of the most written about stories ever, <coughs> at least in contemporary study of Agadah. Every single self-respecting Agadist out there has written a paper about this story. So before we try and reinvent the wheel, what I'd like to do is actually give you some sort of overview of the other interpretations given to this story. And then we can see if we can try on the basis of that to create one ourselves. And I'd like to start with the classical commentators, namely Rashi. Look at number seven. He has separated himself from me because of old age. So Rashi and a few other commentators who follow suit say this is a story of an elderly couple. They are past their sexual prime, and this is what why the story happens the way it does. Now, what do you think? Are you convinced that this makes sense to you? Well, if he's past his prime, then how do we have relations? Exactly. There is an actual encounter in our story. So clearly, they're not past their sexual prime. Moreover, we have a yeah. There is also a belief, so I was guessing familiarity. Um, King David, uh, as much as he loved Bathsheba, apparently eventually uh, tired of her, and they need to bring in Abishai with the belief, at least the hope, that Abishai is going to go in. So, I like what you're saying very much because I think ultimately we will be going very much in that direction. Yes, there's another. He's just going to call him that he jumped up the tree. Sorry. Exactly. That's another thing. This is not a man of ninety if he's climbing up a tree. Yeah. I have to disagree. All right. So. It's how to make someone younger. Sorry. It's how to make someone younger. How to make someone younger. So that's kind of right. That's, that's, that's what I mean. He got the strength to climb a tree that he probably didn't know he had. <laughs> right. It's right. So, so I think that's thing. really how Vashi reads it. Um, I have to say I agree with some of the sentiments expressed here. I don't find this, I mean, with tremendous respect to Rashi, I don't find this extremely convincing because there are too many sides here that do denote a younger man or woman. Um, 
So let's move on to the second basic school of interpretation. And already, this is already modern commentators um, who actually take very serious the role that Agada must always be read in context. So they look back. They look back on some of the stories that happened directly before our own. Now, I said directly before our own, there's a series of seduction stories. Some of them are very famous. I'm sure some of you have heard of some of them. And I brought two. I think the two immediate ones before our own, no, not two immediate ones, but within very close proximity to ours, uh, in number eight. And can I ask for another reader? Someone in the front row. Someone in the front row, said the cameraman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Rev. Mayer used to scoff at transgressors. One day, Satan appeared to him in the guise of a woman on the opposite bank of the river. As there was no ferry, he seized the rope and proceeded across. When he had reached halfway along the rope, he, Satan, let him go, saying, Had they not proclaimed in heaven, Take heed of Rev. Mayer and his learning? I would have valued your life at two mas. Rev. Kiva used to scoff at transgressors. One day, Satan appeared to him as a woman on the top of a palm tree. Grasping the tree, he went climbing up. When he reached halfway up the tree, he, Satan, let him go, saying, Had they not proclaimed in heaven, take heed of Rebbe Akiva and his learning? I would have valued your life at two miles. Thank you. So, those are two of the very many seduction stories that we have just before our own. Um, and the commentators who look at our story in relation to these are right in claiming that there are very many similarities. Anyone want to throw out some similarities between what we just read and our own story? The climbing of a tree. The climbing of a tree, absolutely. Um, I will say, incidentally, we do have, throughout the Talmud, um, connection between seduction and climbing of a tree. Oh, no, and climbing, general climbing. Sometimes it's ladders. And I'm going to bracket that. Sorry? It's very hard to climb a climb tree, yes. Have you tried? Also, yes. It's a very hard thing. Right, right. So Rabbi Akiva had separated himself from his wife for many years. Ah, so what we have here is a seduction. In all three stories, we have seduction, and we have seduction of a very great rabbi in all three accounts. And something else that holds... Disguise. Sorry? Disguise. We have disguise, very good. We have the woman who is what she is not, to quote Shakespeare. Uh, and we also have, not in these stories, but in other stories, we have a fire motif. So the commentators who say this story is directly linked to the stories that come beforehand are right saying that much. And then they say, well, if these stories are so similar to each other, then this is just another seduction story. It's another story of the ensnaring and undoing of a pious man by a treacherous femme fatale, who in our story happens to be his wife. Look at number nine. Huh? The devil takes the shape of Reb Chia Bar Ashi's wife, manipulating him into a situation from which there is no way out other than death. The narrative demonstrates that man cannot free himself from the firm grip of the evil inclination. Thank you. So what do we think about this second interpretation? Are we convinced? Do we like it? Well, how, does, how does she reconcile that with the, the text which seems to say his wife said no, it was me? Meaning? In that she says it's the devil takes the shape of his wife. And then in the end, it's, a, it's his wife, and she gives very him good. sons. Very good, very good, probably, that's one point. Maybe she sees a continuation of the stories here. Sorry? Maybe she sees some kind of continuation. She devil, does, devil, devil. she does. But my question is, is this continuation valid? Are these stories really that similar to each other? No, but it's, it's, it's what he says himself, though. He says to his wife, I wanted I to do that, to I intended to. Right. Therefore, my evil inclination did right. get the better of me. Right. Therefore, I deserve to die, and right. there's no escape. And, and then he starves himself to death. So actually, that's... But I think that's, that's key what you just said. What happens at the end of this story? He dies. He dies. He dies. What happens in the other stories? They don't die. They don't die. Slight difference. But I never perform anything because halfway through the tree. Exactly. And I think that... Okay, so let me start with saying, and this is basic, but it's important. Our story is a lot longer. 
and it's infinitely richer in detail. There is a lot more going on. There's a lot more subjects. <coughs> Two, all the other stories end with a narrow last minute escape. They would nearly suggest, but then they weren't. Our story ends with a seduction. The rabbi doesn't nearly escape, doesn't nearly fall and escape, he falls. Also, in the, the cases with Rabbi Akiba, they were used to scoff at transgressors, whereas right. in our story, he was afraid of it. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and we're going to get to, the, to that point exactly. Um, but I'm going to go back to the previous point you made about the woman. In all the other transgression stories, the woman is a very secondary character. She's background. Her only role is to actually occasion the seduction. That's all, that's all she has to do. That is not at all what happens in our story. In our story, she is a character, a real character. We know what she thinks, we know what she feels. Not only that, we actually experience the story through her eyes. We know what she knows. If we, if we were experiencing the story through Alkhia's eyes, it would have been a very different story. And the fact that the rabbis choose to tell this story through her point of view makes her far more than a secondary character. It makes her the heroine. So this story is qualitatively different than all the stories that came beforehand, and we can't say that it's one interpretation for all. Yes. There's one other thing. In our story, between numbers 9 and 10, mm -hmm. we have a major omission. He jumped up and went and brought it to her. Yes, when it absolutely. Came so the fact is, we don't know for sure what actually happened. And the reader has to supply that information, make assumptions. Now, it's logical to assume that, in fact, there was a the seduction was... Well, he admits to it at the end, so... Nevertheless, nevertheless, we don't know for sure. We still have to supply it. We don't know for sure. And, and here I'd like to say something again about the, the, the language of the Talmud. Uh, it's generally modest. Oh, that's a silly thing to say. It's terribly immodest in places. It's actually awfully immodest in places. Uh, a week and a half ago, I gave another class um, about an awful story of defecation in the Talmud. And it was not at all modest. But I think here there is a sort of you know, the narrator modestly drawing the curtain on the scene and leaving it to the reader's imagination. I read it as very conclusively saying that seduction <laughs> happened because he afterwards admits to it and ends up starving himself to death because of it. Um, but he could be also feeling guilty about what he was prepared to do or having demanded services of her. That in important. itself would have been enough for, yeah. for someone to feel terribly guilty. I think there, there are enough stories in the Talmud. There are many stories in the Talmud here and elsewhere of rabbis who nearly transgress and then they don't. I think if that would have been the case, the Talmud would have told it that way. That's, that's my sense. No, the signs seem to be like the, the, yeah. she's describing yeah. what they actually did and so she had to Well, the it. signs is generally read to me in the pomegranate that she demanded as paper. But there could be more to the sign. The, right. The, it's interesting to, like, why, why use the word sign? Why not just say she showed him the pomegranate? There seem to be in our story two autonomous characters equally interacting with each other. In the previous stories, there is passivity. Yes. There is a testing. Yes, Satan yes. is testing these guys. Yes. They are totally passive. Absolutely. And in fact, they just, um, you know, they just actually escape right. that temptation, right. but not even actively. Right. They don't seem to actually have pulled back. Yeah. The Satan actually yes. decides to pull back. Yes. So yes. they are totally passive, yes. and they are, you know, I don't understand those stories are more difficult to understand even than our story, in my mind. Hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. They certainly, they seem to be more... It's this testing thing from Satan trying to prove something. I don't know in what context he was saying before. It makes what Satan into a teacher, by the way. It makes Satan into a teacher. He's actually just, given them a good... It's not good, rare. I good, mean, good, Satan good, uh, does form, take the guise of an educator, or at least does things in order to educate. The overarching... If I had to you know, narrow down the general message of all of these stories, and there are very many others, is the general Talmudic dictum of en apotophus lavayot. The sexual urge is really dangerous, really dangerous. And you can't guard yourself enough against it. Um, yes? I had a question. If somebody wasn't lost in translation here, because when he says in 16, nevertheless, my intention was to violate the prohibition, 
if he had done something, he would have said, nevertheless, I violated the prohibition. He didn't say, I violated it. My intention was to. What's the reason? He did not violate it. It was his wife. It was his wife. Not only because it was his wife. But wait, That's I'm going to did, ask you all to, any questions that have to do with our story, please hold on to them, because we haven't even got to our story yet, and I'd like to move ahead. So, last two questions, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Also, I mean, brother, and everything, especially if you bring in the Beruia story. Sorry? The Beruia story. The Beruia story. The Beruia story is very similar to our own. I don't want to bring it in at all, for the simple reason that the Beruia story, and this surprises many people, is not at all in the Talmud. It's not in the Talmud. It's a much later tradition, which Rashi then brings in this commentary. But all we have in the Talmud is the ominous phrase, Ma'asebuya, and that can mean anything. And then it evo it's evolved into later interpretations of a seduction story where the genders are reversed. Um, yes? In the same, the common denominator is, is the female, is the, the wife or the, even the Satan tends to be a female who's enticing the man to, yes. to come to her. Yes. Um, there's no manipulation here of a man going forth, forth coming to a female and, and, and name of her. It's right, right, right. Certainly in all of these stories, the women, or right. the Satan come woman, Tomorrow, assumes a more active role. Okay, I really would like to move ahead, so I'm going to pause the role of questions here, and we'll go back in a little bit. Um, <coughs> Okay, so that was the second interpretation, and we found that also somewhat unconvincing, so I'd like to go on to the third. And the third one is really interesting. Um, the man who took the lead on this was um, local Jerusalem scholar Shlomo Ne'e, who wrote a very, very, very important essay on this story, and since then, everybody who's ever written about this story have, you know, feel the need to quote this essay, and and uh, comment on it, because it's considered the most important piece of Chirutha scholarship. Um, we'll get to his essay in a little bit, but for now, I'd like to give over his general interpretation, which is agreed upon by him, but then by everybody who follows, Admir Kosman, and Ruth Calderon, and Ishai Rosen Svi, and Ido Chevroni, and Dina Stein, they all sort of follow suit. Now, to understand this interpretation, we have to understand something about the Talmud. The Talmud was compiled um, very much during the ascent of Christianity. Christianity, during the compilation of the Talmud, is growing increasingly successful, first as a sect within Judaism, and, and then as an autonomous religion outside of Judaism. Uh, and Judaism feels threatened, and has to sort of stand its ground. And so very often in the Talmud, we'll find implicit or veiled attacks on Christian beliefs or Christian practices. You have to know to look for these things because they're often subtext. Um, but if you read the Talmud in these eyes, all of a sudden things will come out at you which you haven't noticed before. For instance, there's this very famous Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, V'chi Adav Shal Moshe Osot Milchama. Are you familiar with this? The story of the war between the Israelites and the Amalekites in the desert, and Moshe goes up on a hill and lifts his hands, and when he lifts his hands, they win, and when he puts down his hands, they lose. And the Mishnah says, it was not at all the hands of Moses, it was the fact that when he lifted his hands, the Israelites prayed, or remembered God, and that's what caused them to win. So this is a lovely vault, a Mishnahic vault, on the meaning of prayer. But, think about it this way. We have a man standing, his arms are lifted. Not like this, but like that. Mm -hmm. And the rabbis of the Mishnah really don't want for people to think that this pose has any intrinsic power in it. This is a veiled dig at the cross. So we're changing our religion for, for... Sorry? We're changing our religion for Christians? For the benefit of the Christians? Is that what you're saying? A lot. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but very... Nothing new. There are quite a few instances in the Talmud where, yes, where the rabbis are actually very much going on the defensive. Um, and this is one of them. According to Shlomo Ne'eh and all the other interpreters, um, they say this is the rabbi's attack against the Christian ideal of abstinence. They claim that around the time in the Jewish communities of Syria, which apparently is where this story is taking place, um, Christianity became very popular. 
abstinence became extremely popular, so much so that some Jews began to be taken in by it, began to adopt this. And the rabbi is actually telling this story as a cautionary tale against abstinence. You're going to try and abstain from your wife, you'll end up sinning with a prostitute. Look at number 10. Did you go on? The Syriac Christian idea of a war for freedom in the sexual impulse captivated members of the Babylonian Jewish community. The story is a negative portrayal of the aesthetic ideal, or at least its presentation as irremediably at odds with the common Jewish ideal of family life. So according to this reading, it was Lachia's aesthetic sensibilities that lead him to his tragic end. Now, just like the other stories were very much based on parallel narratives, so this interpretation is also based on parallel narratives within our tradition. Can anybody think of any? A story in which a woman is deprived of her sexual relations and she has to... is the obvious one. And we will go on to see how our story is very, very closely based on the story of Tamal in Genesis 38. We also have the following interesting midrash in number 12. Are you sick of reading it? A woman was propositioned by a man. She said to him, where will you go? What did she do? She went and told his wife. The wife went to that place and he slept with her. Then he regretted it and sought his death. Said his wife to him, from your bread you have eaten and from your cup you have drunk, but you are rude of manner. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, another very similar story we have in a much later text called Yalkut HaMechiri, maybe some of you on your Shavuot learning have um, encountered this. It's actually a story of a conception of David. According to this Midrash, David's mother, the wife of Yishai, was unloved, and Yishai separates himself from her, um, and then has this rendezvous with another woman. The other woman tells Yishai's wife she takes the place of the rendezvous, and that is how David was born. Um, it's amazing how these men don't know their wives. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but that's actually very much what happened Starting in our story. <laughs> yeah. Right. I agree. It really is remarkable that they don't recognize them. Um, okay, so that was the third interpretation. What do we think of that one? It's a good one. It's a really good one. I'll grant you that. But at least she chastises him. Sorry? At least she chastises him. Yes. Him. But she forgives him. Sorry? She forgives him. She forgives him, yes. But I mean, again, the interpretation of our story. The idea, think about it, the idea that Rabkhia, the greater Rabkhia, is deliberately abstaining from relations with his wife. And this is what causes our story. Yeah. I think Christianity until today has a that's a very uh, fixed idea of, of sex and That's very true. That is very true. But what I'm asking is, are we all okay with this understanding? Yes. Well, part, partly problematic is that at the end, what does he do to, to do a ticket for this ascetism? Is he fasts himself he fasts, to death, which yes, seems to contradict the Which is very ironic, I agree. Um, but also, it's not really ascetic, because it's... It's actually uh, removing himself from his wife, not from women. So the abstinence ah. is seemingly directed to the so wife. So you're already picking up on something which is very, very true, and where exact, I'm, I'm going to go exactly in that direction. But first, I, again, because I have to tell you, I mean, this is very much how everybody reads the story. I have a problem with this reading. I have a very basic problem with this reading. It's a violation of the What's that? It's a violation of the Ketubah. Is it though? Yes. In Christianity, of all the world shapes, sex is the man's prerogative and the woman's obligation as opposed to... Right, exactly. Judaism has a basic conjugal obligation of the husband to the wife. Yes, this is halakhically mandated. A man must have relations with his wife at regular intervals. 
as opposed to Jesus who commanded women to submit to their husbands. Paul. Paul. And different men of different professions have different intervals in which they must have relations with his wife, with their wives. And rabbis actually can go for the longest without fulfilling this obligation. But even they, six months, I think, according to the Talmud, every six months must satisfy, satisfy their wives. But, but without without rabbi Akiva. Well, that's a special So story. unless the wife agrees. <laughs> unless that's the caveat. Unless the wife agrees to wait for the wife. If the wife wants sex, a man has to. But what happens if, if it's the other way around? No, so, so she has got more say in the matter. I mean, well, she can't well. refuse him either. But if, right. she, if she agrees to, like Rachel, we call her Rachel, the Talmud doesn't actually ever call her Rachel, but the wife of Rabbi Akiva actually agrees to let him go off for 12 and then another 12 years. Um, we don't have any sign of such a concession in the story. Just the opposite. In the story of Moshe Rabbeinu, we, we see that the whole issue with right, the, right, exactly. He's she actually was chastised by his right. 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 Yes. It, it seems in the story that Rav Chia's Yetzer Hara is very, very strong. Yes. And by abstaining and not having sexual relations with his wife, <laughs> it will become even stronger. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so when he says, my intention was to violate the prohibition, there's something in that that perhaps he was really looking to um, satisfy his sexual urges elsewhere. Right, so, so this ties into what you said, and, and that's exactly where we're going to go. But I want to just close off this third interpretation. I have a huge problem with the fact that we know we have this chovat ona, this conjugal obligation, which the great Rabbi Chia, Rav Chia, according to this interpretation, is just electing not to keep. To me, that sounds rather strange. And even if he actually does, of his own accord, elect not to keep, why does the wife not do anything? Why doesn't no, does she regard this blatant violation of her rights? Halakhically, she could sue for divorce at this point. Maybe she loves it. Because women never have the courage to do such things, especially against uh, big allies. I think you can accuse the woman of us of many things, but I think lack of courage is not one of them. It took her um, a couple of years. Sorry? It took her a couple of years. Ah, well, okay, so... She I blamed will... herself. So... <laughs> <laughs> Let's hold off. I, I, I think you're actually all right, but I want to get there. Um, no, right, right. Um, and what to me is the most disturbing question is say Rav Chia did decide to wage holy war against his sexual inclination because he was taken in by Christianity. If he managed so many years to not go near his wife, why is it that he sees a prostitute and within, a, like, within seconds he propositions her without even a hint of resistance? This doesn't seem to be, to me, a man who's spent years trying to sort of clamp down on his sexual urges. So... There is, there is another thing, which is she made herself up, and, and that's there's something... No, right, I mean, right, right. To, that's let's, part of the okay, story as well. Yes, all right, let's, let's get there. I want to get there. I am, yes, love it. Okay, yes. Let, let me get there. She tried very hard. I am clamping down now for all further discussion. Um, yeah. Until the next time. Oh my god. So, one question who was the rabbi? The that, uh, that, that abstained, the four that entered the paradise, there was one of them that abstained from... Uh, uh, one, one of the four didn't marry. Yeah, and, and, they were, and um, he was very, very chastised by the yes, other rabbi. Yes, but that so was, was about marriage. Clear, it wasn't... Yeah, well, I mean, marriage and... You would think, yes. Um, right. It was either Ben Azai or Ben Zuma. I keep getting the two mixed up. Ben Azai. Ben Azai. Ben Azai. Um, Thank you. So, it's a good interpretation, but I think it needs a bit of fine-tuning. And that's what I'd like to propose this evening. Um, and my claim is this. It's not aversion to sexual relations in general that plagues our Bichir. It's an aversion specifically to sexual relations with his wife, the Madonna. 
But I want to go back to the beginning and actually look at our story now, okay? Um, now, our story, like very many nice good Talmudic stories, is composed of three acts. Uh, act one, in lines one and two, which I will call Revelation. <laughs> act two, in lines three to nine, which I will call Seduction. And Act three, in lines 10 to 17, which I will call Confrontation. Um, now, Act one opens, again, like many good Talmudic stories, with a routine about to be broken. Very often, a Talmudic story will start with, this is what always happened, and then one day something else happened. And our story very much follows the same structure. What always happened? What is the routine? What's the routine with which our story opens? He prostrates and says, may the, evil one, may the merciful one save me from the evil inclination. In the Talmud, when we say evil inclination, we generally mean the sexual urge. Um, and what this prey intimates is a routine of <coughs> abstinence. For many years, Rav Chia has separated himself from his wife. Again, we've seen how most interpreters follow this direction, and we've seen that we find it slightly problematic, and we need some further elaboration. And to elaborate, I'd like to bring in Zygmunt Freud. <coughs> now, so, boss, this has to do with the text at the end of the Shemal, at the end of the year. Right, 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 yes, thank you. Um, um, when you prostrate yourself, that actually means, thank you, the moment of nefilat uh, which traditionally is the moment in which you leave the text of the Siddha and you sort of say what is really in your innermost of hearts. Um, and this is what is in the innermost of Ochia's hearts. Now, Freud, we don't have to agree with everything that Freud says, I know I definitely don't, but he has got one very acute sensitivity to cultural phenomena. If he, could, if he says, if he sees a cultural phenomenon that is across the board, that is happening in very many different cultures, even though these cultures didn't necessarily ever interact or influence one another, Freud will immediately assume that the root for this phenomenon is in the human mind, in the human psyche. Not in something social or cultural, but psychological. And so Freud sees that across the board, every culture has a Madonna Hall paradigm. And he says, well, clearly the Madonna Hall paradigm originates in a Madonna Hall complex. Now for Freud, um, the Madonna Hall complex works like this. Men, he speaks about men. It's very interesting <coughs> to consider whether this works equally for women. It's been clear that it does, but he speaks about men. And we're going to talk about men because this is what our story is about. Men who fail to um, establish a healthy or positive attitude towards sex will at some point develop what he calls a psychical split. Um, and look at number 13. And I apologize for some of the risque language. <laughs> Having said that, does everybody want to read? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not reading it. <laughs> yeah, the whole sphere of love remains divided in the two directions personified in art as sacred and profane, or animal, love. When they love, they do not desire, and when they desire, they cannot love. If someone makes an impression that might lead to a high psychical estimation of her, this impression does not find an issue in any sensual excitation, but an affection which has no erotic effect. This psychical impotence manifests itself in a refusal by the executive organs of sexuality to carry out the sexual act, although before and after they may show themselves to be intact and capable of performing the act. Thank you. Um, so what Freud says basically is that men were played by the Madonna Hall complex will develop a split in their mind between Madonnas and whores, or objects in love and objects of desire. Where they love, they do not, where they love, they do not desire, and where they desire, they cannot love. Um, so when a man grows to love a woman, to respect her, you know, with Freud it all goes back to the mother, she reminds me of his mother, and therefore he cannot 
regard her erotically, he cannot desire her, and then ultimately he cannot perform with her sexually. It's a form, says Freud, of impotence. Um, now, if this is true, and if Afria has a negative attitude towards sex, and all commentators seem to agree that he does, it's not at all inconceivable that he should develop a psychical split of this nature. Placing his wife, an object of sacred life, as Freud says, far beyond the realm of the sensual, divested of all erotic desire. Now his sexual drive may remain potent, and dangerously so, but his wife can no longer arouse it. By this reading, it's not that Rav Chia refuses to fulfill his marital obligations. He can't. Now what do men do when faced with the Madonna Hall predicament? According to Freud, they generally will find an outlet in the form of what he calls a debased sexual object. And that's the last paragraph in 13. Could you go on? Man is assured of complete sexual pleasure only when he can devote himself unreservedly to obtaining satisfaction, which with his well-brought-up wife, for instance, he does not dare to do. This is the source of his need for a debased sexual object, a woman who is ethically inferior, to whom he need attribute no aesthetic scruples, who does not know him in his other social relations, and cannot judge him in them. It is to such a woman that he prefers to devote his social, sexual potency, even when the whole of his affection belongs to a woman of a higher kind. Thank you. So, the violent struggle betrayed by Rav Chia's friend is not against lust for his own wife, as many critics have claimed. On the contrary, his wife, who's saintly and pure and safely asexual, is no threat. It's against the women beneath her, those low, licentious women who may stare at his sexual impulse, who may burst the dam of his raging desire, which we'll see is exactly what happens. Now what about the wife? How does she regard her husband's many years celibacy? Okay. Mm -hmm. She wants to She's frustrated. She wants sexual. Does she though? Does she know? Why does he ignore me? Sorry? Why does he ignore me? She says that. That she says only when she hears him pray. But she had to have heard him pray before saying that. What happens before that? I think she mistook the prayer to be something against her. And so then she felt uh, more offended, maybe. No. Here's the no. thing. Okay. He, there's a bit of a problem when you read Agada because on the one hand, I very much believe, you know, in reading the whole thing through first and then going back. However, we can never judge what is happening now by what we know is about to happen. We know she's about to hear him and then she will get dressed up and seduce him. I'm not talking about what happened. I'm talking about the first sentence. There is a reality of marital abstinence. What does the wife do about it? Nothing. Nothing, at all. nothing, nothing. whatsoever. <coughs> She accepts it. Why does she accept it? Because she, he's because he, she thinks that he's impotent. And until she hears him asking, please save me from the urge, she says, well, he's got the urge, but it's not towards me. But maybe till then, she just thinks he's got a, he's impotent. She's duty bound to it. So, but that's why is it your communication? What do you think is going to be on the head? All the relationships can be on a much higher level. And I think that people uh, sometimes cut them off a little bit uh, if it's anger. If it's brother. They just leave things out there. If you're playing in Venus and Mars, then you need to talk. If you're you have to communicate, you need to find that actually right. sexually, these things are God gave you the opportunity to come together, even during the greatest frustrations and greatest angers. Use this to come together, not to be angry, not to hold things back, but to find a way of lifting even higher. Let's read on one more sentence. She hears him, and what's her reaction? What's her emotive reaction? <coughs> Sorry? <coughs> Which is what? What emotion is that? Surprise. Surprise! She's surprised. She's surprised because what? What did she think before? She thought he was yeah, impotent. 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 He's saying, save me from sexual urge. And she's saying, wait a second, you don't have any sexual urges because you separated from me and have had no sexual urges towards me. 
which therefore Samidhi, means that you don't have any sexual urges at all. She seems to have believed that her husband is far beyond the throes of physical passion, that he's this holy man who has fought his physical urges and won. And possibly because of that, because she thinks that this is what he wants, maybe she agreed to not say anything. She agreed to waive her conjugal rights, yielding to what she believed to be her husband's wishes. Look at number 14. Could you read on? She was, no doubt, uncomfortable with the situation, but submitted, understanding, possibly also admiring, the man angel with whom she lived. And herein lies the full tragedy of the Balashi's marital life. <laughs> Each thinks something. A husband and wife, both contending with unfulfilled sexual needs, and both believing themselves to be alone in the struggle. For what makes their situation all the more pitiable is their apparent inability, as Tom said, to talk about it. Throughout this entire first act, and admittedly it's short, but throughout the entire first act, there is absolutely no communication. Neither seems able to tell the other how they feel. Elfria prefers to confess his yearnings in prayer, afraid, perhaps, that if he made such an admission to his Madonna-like chaste wife, she would despise him. And she can't bring herself to tell him of her desires for fear of incurring his contempt. So it's not just sexual relations that Rafi and his wife abstain from. It's all relations. Yes. I don't want to debase the conversation. Let's try not to. <laughs> 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 One, this happens very commonly with couples who've been married for a long time. It happens with people as they get older. One of the possible responses is fantasy. Uh, couples sometimes engage in role playing, for example. Could it be that this is what he is talking about? And that this is what she did when she dressed up? So I think very much, first of all, that's not that debasing. My sense is when even the classical commentator said they were old and then she got dressed up, mm -hmm. my sense is it was possibly a form of some sort of role play. Um, I'd like to go in a slightly different direction, uh, but not that different to what you're now suggesting. Um, but I see that it's getting late, so I really would like to move ahead. Um, to the break in the routine. This routine is one day broken. Overhearing her husband's anguished plea, the wife realizes how far the gulf between them has become how her own secret desire is actually mirrored by him. How he is no more a man angel than she is a Madonna. What doesn't she do at this point? Approach him as a Talk to him. Bring it up over the supper table. <laughs> Why? Sorry? Do they, did they do that? Did they talk? Yes. There's been a history of situations where there's been no communication. Oh, it's, it's I mean, we, we do that now. I don't we know. do that. We seem to. We need talking about that. There was communication. There was communication. We see it in other stories. Um, I mean, we also, see, for example, I'm thinking of another brewery story, for example. Right. I mean, you know, those are about Yeah. Um, and yet, we do have other stories, other domestic scenes, in which there is communication. Not a lot. You're, you're right, there isn't a great deal. A, because the Talmud tells its stories in a very terse, compact kind of way. And B, because, well generally because what I'm about to say now, I think. Um, one interpretation as to why they don't talk is that if they did talk, we'd have no story. <laughs> <laughs> and this is actually true. The Talmud very often would rather show, not tell. Look at number 50. I think she's angry. Oh. I mean, that's... 
The wife of Rav Chia does not, does not choose to verbally confront her husband, <coughs> perhaps because the narr narrator would rather express the dramatic tension <coughs> through an actual visual conflict. So, according to what Kadalon, we want to have an actual visual conflict. <coughs> I think there's a possible other reason here. What about Jesus doesn't know any different? Sorry? What about if she just doesn't know any different? This is how she's been exposed. I mean, if you look back, Tamara went to that point where she became a prostitute when there was also no communication between Yehuda right. and Tamara, and she went and took action. No, but clearly she does know that something the same is thing. wrong here because her reaction. Yeah, but I'm saying know each one of them, the woman realized there was something wrong, but didn't know how to respond, so they did it in this way. And my so sense is, I could be wrong, but my sense is, given what, about what she's about to do, and, and I want to really get there because it's quite brilliant. My sense is she knows exactly what's wrong and she knows exactly how to deal with it. And I'm going to say this. I think the reason she doesn't talk to him, beyond the fact that then we have no story, is I think she really gets the gravity of the situation. I think she realizes how serious her husband's condition is, how entrenched he is in his Madonna Hall complex. And she realizes that talking to him at this point would be completely futile. I think she realizes that her husband will not touch her as long as she remains a Madonna in his eyes. And to bring down the barrier between them, she must become a whore instead. Let's move on to Act 2. Um, <clears throat> Act 2, if you go back to the story. <clears throat> opens with another far more radical break in the routine. One day, he was studying in his garden. Now, um, the action of the story shifts from the decorum and the order of the home to the wildness and disorder of the garden. Now, what's important here is that at the times of the Talmud, the garden wasn't adjacent to the home. Okay, it's not the backyard. The garden is on the outskirts of town. And it's very, very rare to find a rabbi who's actually studying in the garden. The only other times we find a rabbi studying in the garden is if the subject matter of the actual study is somehow related to agriculture. And yet what we have here is a rabbi studying in a garden. We have these lush surroundings. We will soon have a feminine seduction, a plucking of the fruit, does any of this sound familiar? Um, there, we have here a very ominous connotation to the Garden of Eden, as if Rafia's controlled celibate world is about to descend into sin. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I really want to move ahead, so let me hold off with all questions and open the floor a little later. Um, and just as the scenery changes, so is our heroine transformed from an obedient, self-sacrificing wife. She becomes a harlot, one who is, to quote Nita Gobanel, loyal primarily to herself. And like the wanton women of the generation of Noah, she makes herself up as a harlot. The Aramaic phrase actually used is kishta, and kishta in the Talmud generally means female preparation for and solicitation of sex. Um, seeking in this painted disguise to seduce her own husband, to entice her husband into releasing his own pent-up energy, and at the same time satisfy her own desires. Now this is not, I would like to argue, a test of fidelity. Some scholars have read this as a test of fidelity. She's trying to see whether he's going to succumb to the chance of another woman. I don't think this is what is, what is happening here. For one thing, because at the end she's not at all angry. This, I read this as a very desperate attempt to regain lost intimacy with her husband. Look at number 16. <coughs> Anybody like to read who's not yet read? <coughs> I'm discovering that Rabbi Hia 
and not eliminated his evil inclination, assumes that his abstinence is not a result of religious conviction, but rather of a mental or emotional problem. She decides, therefore, to take matters into her own hands and come to help her tormented husband. Thank you. <laughs> and indeed, the moment he sees, the moment of fear sees this ethically inferior woman, as Freud calls them, he demands her identity. What doesn't he do to Hila? Doesn't talk. No, he does. He actually does. But not in the, in the way that one would want someone to talk. You said beforehand, you spoke about men who fail to recognize their husband. He doesn't recognize her. It couldn't have been that good a disguise. And again, the, the failure here to recognize his own wife attests to the degree of alienation between them. Now the wife responds and says, I am Kharuta and I've just returned today. Kharuta, according to Rashi, was the name of a famous courtesan, a famous prostitute in the town. Now, another basic rule of thumb when studying Agadah is Agadot are very compact. They're terse. They're very, very sparing with the words that they use. And if we see every word, every phrase, if we see something that seems to serve no purpose, we must ask, why is this here? Now look at the story. What would have been if the story would have read like this? Line four, his wife made herself out and passed before him repeatedly. Line seven, he demanded her services. Would have been the same story. We don't need this dialogue. In fact, this dialogue here slows things down. It disrupts the height of the drama that is now evolving. So why interrupt the drama with this two-line dialogue? It's as if he knows all of them. So he's a new one on the block. Let's let's try and curb our criticism of what here. Yes, it kind of uh, reminds me of Boaz, when we just read, um, actually says Miat. Right, 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 right. So when she lays at his feet. Guy sees um, I'd like to say there are a few roles that this two-line dialogue plays. First of all, it's a dialogue. For the first time in the story, Rav Khirba Ashi and his wife are communicating. Um, the yearnings that up to now were so carefully concealed are now openly announced. Oscar Wilde said, it's number 17 on your sheet, give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. I think that's often why we have the need to dress up, because behind a mask we sometimes feel more comfortable, paradoxically, to be who we really are. This is what happens with Ophelia's wife. Under that mask, behind that mask of, this, of the prostitute, she flagrantly asserts her sexuality. This, hold on, the sexuality she was so careful about hiding up to now. And Rav Khir too, the moment he sees this woman, this debased sexual object, this woman who, as Freud says, doesn't know him in his other social relations and cannot judge him in them, he freely solicits her services. So there's already, the barriers are coming down. That's one thing. Two, the wife's assertion, I am Khiruta and I just returned today, that signifies far more than her promiscuous dress or her provocative manner, a major change of identity. She goes from a nameless, safe, selfless wife of to an autonomous, full-fledged subject. The former Madonna has now, as she says, says, returned. She's changed. She's come into her own. If you look at number second. Um, number 18, name, naming is a symbolic and literal act of mastery. When you name someone, you exercise power over them. If you name yourself, you exercise power over yourself. And in naming herself, in acquiring a name, the wife exhibits all of the autonomy and self-determination that she acquires in her new role as well. Uh, and that is the third, and I think most important, role of this dialogue. The name that she assumes, Cheruta. Now Cheruta has sent scholars on this wild goose chase because we don't have any other Cheruta throughout the Talmud. It's a nonce word. It doesn't appear anywhere else. And so scholars sort of run scholarly circles around themselves trying to explain what this word means. And it's been given many explanations. It's been interpreted as liberty and as famous courtesan. 
as a wedding party, as a reveler, as a released prisoner, as a withered branch that has now begun to blossom. Um, but the most rigorous analysis, um, and I think by far the most convincing one, is the one by, again, Shlomo Na'e. Shlomo Na'e, um, who's a great scholar, <coughs> realizes there's no chiruta in the Talmud. And so what he does is he goes looking for the instances of chiruta, or words that use the same root, in contemporaneous Syriac texts, in texts from the same time in the same geographical region. And he comes to a very, very interesting, like the whole essay is a lot of Greek, and you can't read half of it. But he comes to a very interesting conclusion at the end. He says, Chiruta is actually a pun. It means two completely opposite things. Look at number 19. Thank you. Um, who is Tom? Would you go on? Thank you. The world is remarkable for its Jewish like duality of meaning. On the one hand, it reflects a life of self control and suppression of impulse, the celibacy and dignity, the obligation of the social class of free persons. On the other hand, it expresses the enticement of a sort of freedom that entails unrestrained behavior, debauchery, and licentiousness. Session on Echerwuta is a pun. You find it very often meaning sexual freedom, debauchery, licentiousness, and on the other hand, you find it meaning freeborn people. And freeborn people are separated from slaves precisely by their ability to exercise sexual restraint and control. So by taking for itself a name that puns on the two opposite meanings of liberty, our heroine seems to be expressing her ability to be both to have both sexual freedom as a wanton harlot and freedom from sexuality as a freeborn nobleman. <coughs> By assuming a name that means both Madonna and whore, she is in effect bringing down the barrier between them. And in that sense, this one word is actually a microcosm of the entire story. Could um, also mean freedom from the need of men's protection, because many women in the time of the Talmud married because they they needed the protection of a male, except right, for some right. very wealthy women who did not need it and did not marry. Actually, the women, the more common instance of women who did not need the protection of men were actually the prostitutes. Paradoxically, they were the most independent of women of their time. Because they could own Because they were not under the thumb of any man. Um, um, Can I just ask you if maybe there's a fourth yes. component? Go on. He's so estranged from her, he doesn't even recognize her voice. <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think the fact that they even dialogue, not just see each other, but there's an element of hearing, and even then he fails to recognize her. Could be, like Elias said, maybe well, they haven't spoken in years. Maybe, 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 no, maybe he, he, he suspected it was her, and he said, who are you? And she said, I'm Kheruta. So it's not clear. It's possible that he he, he did he wanted to believe that, that it was the, the prostitute, but actually, he was, hang on, who are you? There's something familiar about you. Except he couldn't imagine that it was his wife because he was having sexual urges, and his wife was the Madonna. Right. Which is why, that's why he believed her, even though her disguise may not have been that great. Ah. That's, uh, yeah, yeah, I like that. I like that very much. Um, maybe I'm sorry, do you mind if we, I, I know it's fascinating and all, but... Um, <laughs> 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 we really have we'll to stay here all night. Sorry? We don't mind. Like you said, and that is the disc to me, which means 10 minutes. That also, so means, that also means that I wanted to say something, which is very quickly, that I like the idea of freedom, which is what they really needed in, in their sexual life. Ah, mm -hmm. and that's nice. That's it's nice. nine minutes. Yeah. Are you going to talk about the second half of your sentence? About? I just returned to the I think the idea is I have changed, I have shifted, I have metamorphosed. You don't think that there's any subtext here that maybe he had it at one time or they had it at one time? They? The couple. Mm. Well, we know that they did. For many years he said Ah, you're saying that return as in like, I'd like to return to what we had. I think that's very nice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Maybe they're doing role-playing fantasy. Right, so, so that was suggested before. Um, 
Again, I, oh, my sorry. sense is that again, if we're going to read this as somehow Lucia <coughs> suffering from the Donahue complex, then this would not have been enough because he would never have been able to see his wife that way. The very fact that she says it was me at the end and he doesn't believe her <coughs> indicates that. The point is, all of these subtleties are completely lost upon Lucia because he just propositions her, demands her services. Um, but the wife, the woman, is no longer a compliant wife at this point. She's no longer the obedient Madonna, and she demands that he bring her pomegranate from the uppermost bough of the tree. Um, Anarchia, in his desire, climbs up, plucks the fruit, gives it to her, and the narrator modestly draws the curtain on the scene, and we can only infer the seduction has succeeded. Act three, confrontation. So, with the opening of Act 3, the action has shifted back indoors, into the order and civility of the home, and our heroine, <coughs> accordingly, has gone back, has slipped back into her role as compliant wife. Um, as the curtain once again rises, we find her making dinner, dinner. firing up the <laughs> oven, engaged in the most wifely of chores. Um, <laughs> she has gone from Madonna to Hall to Madonna, from kindling her husband's lust to kindling the kitchen fire with complete effortlessness. <laughs> we don't know. Just, well, she don't seems know. to be complete. Gee, you mean we can be gone? <laughs> Sorry. We can be both. I think that's exactly the point. I think that's exactly the point. That she can be proper and passionate and amorous and demure, a Madonna and a whore. The, the feminine binary completely dissolves in her person. I think it's exactly what the Talmud is trying to say. Um, if anything, it's the man, not the woman, for whom the Madonna whore paradigm holds true. It's Lavchia who can't seem to integrate decorum and desire. The events of the past few hours, which have left his wife completely unfazed, have traumatized him to the point of suicide. He comes home, sees his pure, chaste wife standing by the oven, is overcome with grief and shame, and throws himself into it. <laughs> and make no mistake, throwing himself into an oven, there's another source we won't read, about another selection of stories, with a story that ends with the rabbi throwing himself in the oven, it's an attempt at suicide. Um, the gas pit. Sorry? Without the gas pit. Without the gas, gas pit? Gas oven. <laughs> um, now, possibly from the sense of shock, and possibly because of the newfound courage that she has acquired in her role as prostitute, the wife breaks the years of silence and turns to her husband in question. She says, what is this? And again, as opposed to the double monologues of Act 1 and the masked dialogue of Act 2, here, for the very first time, we have direct and open communication between Alfria and his wife. The, the barrier of communication has been shattered. <coughs> And Lachia, unable to keep it from his wife, admits to his transgression, probably afraid that now that she knows the truth about him, she will despise him forever. And yet, rather than pain or anger or derision, his confession is met with one of her own. What did she say? It was me. It was me. The prostitute in the garden, the debased sexual object, that was me. And he doesn't believe. He, doesn't believe. he, he seems to be that. clinging so fiercely to this concept that he is married to a pure, chaste Madonna, he can't believe her capable of such promiscuous conduct. And she, what does she do? She, she, proves it. Proves it. she knew exactly what was going to happen, didn't she? She was prepared for this, and she immediately pulls out the signs, probably the pomegranate that she required as pit. This seems to have been a very carefully thought out plan. If he could, she could only get him to see her for who she is, 
if she could only get him to recognize his sexuality, maybe she could extricate him, maybe she could pull him out of the throes of the Madonna Hall complex. But to no avail. What should have come to Rachia as inexplicable relief, the knowledge that his terrible sin wasn't that terrible after all, it's still bad, okay? Halachically, if you have relations with a woman thinking that she's somebody else, it's still bad. But it's not extramarital sex. Um, this that should have come as inexplicable relief only devastates Rachia even more. He says, Nevertheless, my intention was to violate a prohibition and seemed to turn away from her, perhaps in guilt, perhaps in contempt. Whether he can't forgive himself for succumbing to his evil inclination, or he can't forgive her for failing to be the saint that he had idolized, is unclear. But what is clear, and tragically clear, is that the wife plan, wife's plan has been carried. Of Chia's Madonna Hall complex is still firmly anchored in his mind, and within it she must remain, either a deified and untouched Madonna, or a despised and untouched whore, or a widow, because unable to live with his burning sense of shame, of Chia fasts until he dies of that death. And still known as Rajasman. Sorry? Ah, so you pick up on something very interesting, and I'd like to go exactly there. Uh, she, and he, she said, Lila said very correctly, it ends with that righteous man, a tot sadiq, fasted until he died of that death. Now, there is, uh, Yannick Frankel shows that this is probably a later edition, this one sentence, that maybe it comes to make the story a little more kosher. Um, but there could be another reason. I, the story is very heavily based on two biblical intertexts. We saw that one was the Garden of Eden and the sin of the tree of knowledge, and the other, which has come up here before. And again, the similarities are several. The simani, what else? The disguise. They're both Kadesh. The signs. They're both prostitutes. The signs. They both don't recognize them. They both fail to recognize There's no communication. There is no communication. Fire. Sorry. Fire, death by fire, very good. And the starting point. Sorry? It's family. It's, also they it's family. Him. Sorry? They also agree that uh, themselves that he faulted the. Uh... Ah, ah. So that is already, I think, a huge difference between the stories. Um, but again, the point of departure for two both stories is a woman who is deprived of, deprived of any kind of sexual relations. Yes? Maybe it wasn't, maybe it really was actually quite similar because in both cases, the man wanted to sin, and the woman deprived him of a chance to do it. And they said right here, or they said right here, I intended to. Right. In both cases, she, she they do think the that they're doing what they're doing with the prostitute. She she has, what, what, what is the sin? What's the prohibition of going to a prostitute? You read that initially. Prostitution is... But the thing about Tamara is that she's, she's looking to... to Continue being a Madonna by becoming pregnant right, and, and doing right. a yibum thing, right, rather right. than looking for, for her own Sexual. needs. Whereas this is about need as well, and it, that's a difference as well. Um, I think actually, I, I think what is interesting with these two female protagonists is that they both very easily. You have Tamanu da story number eleven. We won't read it, but they both very easily go from Madonna to whore to Madonna with a simple change of dress. They go from being a dignified woman to a debased prostitute. Um, but I'd like to pick up on what you said to Hila because I think the final note is an important one. And what you said to um, you that's her mouth. The story, the final note is Sadkami Meni. She was more righteous, she is more righteous than I. The final note in our story is Otot Sadiq. That righteous man. It's as if that righteous man and I think there's a hint of irony here, and sometimes when the tongue was said Sadiq, it is with this trace of irony, mm -hmm. cannot bring himself to acknowledge that he was wrong. He cannot bring himself to see the wife for who she really is, a Madonna and a whore, an object of love and of desire, a good woman and a sexual woman, all at the same time. 
And I think that's exactly what this story is trying to do. It's trying to break down that barrier between Madonna and Paul. We have a woman who is both. We have a name that means both. And we have a man whose failure to recognize this leads to his untimely death. We have one more thing, and that is the structure of the story. We said, we saw, we said the story is built of three scenes. The revelation, the seduction, and the confrontation. And I'd like to claim that these scenes are built as a thesis, antith uh, antithesis, synthesis structure. You have scene one, the thesis, the Madonna in the home. Scene two, the antithesis is the prostitute in the garden. And scene three is actually a synthesis, bringing those two scenes together. Because even though we are now back in the civilized home, and the woman is once again the compliant housewife, there are certain whorish elements that punctuate the scene. We have an oven, which is both mundane and menacing, maybe some sort of symbol of female sexuality. We have the woman's assertion in saying, what is this, which she never did before. We have her saying, Anna Havai, it was me, echoing Anna Cheruta, I am Cheruta. And we have a pomegranate, which according to um, Cosma, number 23, is a symbol of lust or fertility. Paul or Madonna. And so the story itself, like its heroine, blurs the boundaries between home and garden, order and chaos, propriety and passion. Madonna and Paul become one. Now, I want to say two things and with this I'll end. One is that I think it's remarkable that a text coming from this time, from that world, which we saw was so steeped in this binary view of women, we have a story which is way ahead of its time, which is able to say, actually, this doesn't work, this dichotomy. It's wrong. Not only wrong, it's immoral. And it will end in death. Um, there are many people who read this story and say it's a feminist story. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we can talk about Talmudic texts as being feminist, because feminism is a very modern concept. Um, but I do think it's profoundly humanistic. It's not just about relations between men and women. I think it's about relations between human beings and human beings. And that reduction of another human being to a stereotype, to a singular function, to a certain role that you play for me. That is not only wrong, this story seems to say, because no person is that one dimensional. And no person is there just to serve you. It's also profoundly immoral. It's dangerous. It will end in death. This became the very cornerstone of the ethical philosophy of Immanuel Kant, possibly the most important ethical philosopher. Um, to have lived. Uh, look at number 24. This is his categorical imperative. At the heart of his ethical structure is this sentence. Act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never merely as a means to an end, but always at the same time as an end. 20th century, Martin Buber comes along and expresses a somewhat similar sentiment in his monumental work, I and Thou, number 25. The real, though certainly swaying and swinging boundary, lies between thou and it, between present, the present and the object. The relation to the thou is direct. No system of ideas, no foreknowledge, and no fancy intervene between I and thou. No aim, no lust, and no anticipation intervene between I, between I and thou. Desire itself is transformed as it plunges out of its dream into the appearance. Every means is an obstacle. Only when every means has collapsed does the meeting come about. And maybe that's why Elfria and his wife never actually had the meeting. If I face a human being as my thou and say the primary word I thou to him, he is not a thing among things and does not consist of things. Whole in himself, he is thou and fills the heaven. This does not mean that nothing exists except himself, but all else lives in his life.
if I had to sort of try and articulate a take on message, it would be this. It's not about feminism, it's not about women, it's not about sexuality. That's not what I've been trying to say. I'm not sure that's what the story essentially, ultimately, is trying to say. It's about human relations. It's relations between men and between, with our partners, but also with our colleagues and our family members and our friends. The dire importance of never ever seeing a person as a means to an end. Never reducing a person to the function that they fill for me. Being able to see the person as they are. Being able to relate to the others in our life in all of their fullness and all of their beauty as the thou that they are. Only then can we really have a relationship. Only then can we really have an encounter. Very good. I just want to say thank you so much, Pula. And thank you so much, uh, and you, David. And um, also, um, 10 shekels or however much you want to give to Chapin Top. Um, Where is Chapin Top? Uh, it is. It's not in my notes. Um, <laughs> it's a very lovely volunteer base. Organization that I think um, in English it's called Table to Table. No, it's not. No, it's, not. It's, not. it's the association of the that takes, <coughs> that take, Within your community, you take care of the poor in your community and you give them according to the needs that they that they that they need. So, for example, if the family needs sugar, you provide sugar. You don't just give them seeds. So it's uh, it goes from community to community. I think Baka takes care of Baka, Katamon takes care of Katamon, and the idea is I think it's on Shabbat, uh, uh, Friday. Friday morning. They uh, it's a secret Santa. They go and they leave it at their door. And and I will say, as the question came up, that I was asked to choose a charity, and there are very many charities that are close to my heart. But I thought this one tied in particularly well with what I was trying to say about really seeing the other in your own. Also, also that um, it's our. This year uh, is on YouTube, which you can either go and look at Shear and Schmooze and see all the other Shear and Schmoozes that Yona has so kindly uh, video for us. Thank you, Yona. But, but also, it's on, uh, we have a Facebook group and it'll be on there. Anybody who's not on Facebook or doesn't want to be on Facebook or whatever can give me an email and I will send you an email. And explain yourself. <laughs> Why are <laughs> Don't ask me when because I don't know the answer. But if anybody wants to volunteer for Limud, and especially if you speak Hebrew, come speak to me afterwards. Ma? Thank you very much. <laughs>